Good afternoon, good evening. I'm really pleased to welcome all of you to this webinar hosted by the Perth US Asia Centre, looking at the Belt and Road Initiative and what are the credible alternatives that Australia, the US and its allies might be able to provide to this initiative. This is of course a very timely discussion in the context of the summits that are underway right now, APEC, ASEAN, G20. And so I'm really pleased to be joined by a very distinguished panel of speakers to unpack what does this initiative mean and how can we respond? Of course, you will have been provided with the link to the report that's been authored by the Perth US Asia Centre's Senior Policy Fellow, Hayley Channer. Hayley is going to present for the first 15, 15 minutes or so to unpack some of the findings of the report. And then we'll be joined by colleagues in Washington from Japan and the US to talk about the Japan and US, to talk about Japan and US's perspectives on this issue. If I could just share with you some of the background about our speakers, Hayley Channer, Senior Policy Fellow, has been with the Centre for a number of years. She brings a vast public and private sector experience, including with the Department of Defence and with the Australian Strategic Policy Institute. She's a Fulbright Scholar and her research is really timely and exciting and we're very excited to publish this report that's been authored by her. I'm also pleased to be joined by Hiroyuki Suzuki, who is the Chief Representative of Japan Bank for International Cooperation in the Washington office, as well as Erin Murphy, who's Deputy Director and Senior Fellow for the Economics Program at the Centre for Strategic and International Studies. This is a very exciting discussion. I'm pleased that all of you have found the time to log into this webinar today. We have people logged in from Indonesia, Taiwan, Korea, Japan, the US, and of course here in Australia. Very much looking forward to the discussion. Hayley, can I hand over to you to kick it off? Thanks very much. Thank you very much, Kate. And can I also extend my huge thanks to Suzuki-san and Erin. They both helped me while I was in Washington, DC to actually develop some of the research for this paper. I also wanted to thank all of the people joining us because I saw a lot of friendly names and um, other people who supported this project. And so I'm looking forward to sharing my findings. So I think this is an important question. I mean, at the moment, we have a lot of different global challenges that we're facing. We have Russia's war in Ukraine. We have concerns over China potentially trying to take Taiwan by force. And we also have the uh, ramifications of the COVID pandemic still wreaking havoc on all our economies. So in this context, why should we really worry about China building things and developing other countries? The reason this matters is because in some cases, the manner in which China's Belt and Road in Initiative is functioning is creating more weakness in developing countries, and it's also expanding China's military and strategic options in the Indo-Pacific. So that's bad for developing countries, and it's bad for the United States and US allies like Australia and Japan. So I have developed um, some slides that I wanted to share, and I will do that now. Okay. For almost a decade, China's Belt and Road Initiative has been screaming ahead of US and allied infrastructure alternatives. In comparison to China, Western countries have been mostly just spinning their wheels trying to catch up. So what we need to do for the next decade is try and gain traction so that we can catch up some of the distance China's made on infrastructure and influence in the region. And that's what my paper's all about. Now, for centuries, China has been famous for infrastructure. In 2020 BC, it finished the Great Wall of China, which is still a structure that can be seen from space. And then more recently in modern times, China has built incredible feats of engineering. This is the Three Gorges Dam. It is the world's largest and most powerful power station. And obviously this is also uh, artificial islands that China has constructed in the South China Sea. Now, both of these two initiatives are incredible feats of engineering. However, with the Three Gorges Dam, it also caused huge controversy because to build the dam, China had to move entire cities, including between 1.5 and 2 million people away from the area 
just to gain enough land for that dam. And it also caused huge environmental damage because there's now more earthquakes, landslides, and even some extinction of animals has been attributed to the building of the Three Gorges Dam. Then if we turn to the South China Sea, again, this is inc an incredible feat of engineering. China made islands where there were no islands in the beginning. And how did it do this? Well, it dredged up sand and piled it up in clumps, and then it shipped every single material into the middle of the sea. Now China has three functioning military bases in the South China Sea. And China's domestic infrastructure boom has spurred its economic growth over the last several decades. And in fact, Australia has gotten really rich as a result of this boom because a lot of our mineral wealth has gone towards China's domestic infrastructure projects. China's gotten so good at building things, they've started building cities without even having enough people ready to move into them. You might have heard of China's ghost cities where whole towns have an overabundance of high-rise buildings, but there's actually no people living there. There are so many of these ghost cities that this year China started demolishing some of these high-rise buildings just to keep house prices from falling dramatically due to the glut. So China's developed this huge capacity for infrastructure and almost 10 years ago they turned this skill into a tool of soft power and foreign influence. China's Belt and Road was one way to export China's excess construction capacity. In contrast, the United States has really struggled to build its own domestic infrastructure. President Biden has struggled to pass domestic infrastructure legislation, including his Build Back Better policy initiative. And in my experience working and living in Washington, D.C. and hearing about the U.S.'s overseas infrastructure initiatives, what really struck me was how ideological the Biden administration and team is on this issue. There's a lot of blue sky thinking, which I would say isn't necessarily practical and not based in the real world. Biden officials want the infrastructure they build overseas to change the world immediately. They want countries to adopt green practices and have sustainable infrastructure. They want gender equality in these countries and the infrastructure to match. They want it to be the highest quality infrastructure in the world. And they want their infrastructure to stamp out corruption and poor governance in developing countries. Now, all of these are fantastic pursuits, but they're more expensive, they take longer, and they're also exporting Western values or liberal democratic values to countries that don't share these values. Quite frankly, this is not a winning formula against China's Belt and Road. Initially and upfront, China asks virtually nothing of developing countries except what would you like? So why is China's Belt and Road a problem for the US and its allies? Look, there are three main reasons why China's Belt and Road is a problem for us. The main one is a military one. Put simply, China could use dual use infrastructure, meaning infrastructure that has either a civilian or military use, uh, things like ports, airstrips, telecommunications. They could use this infrastructure for military purposes. We've already seen China take out a 99 year lease on the port of Hambantota in Sri Lanka. And there are reports that China wants to build a defense base in a small Pacific Island country in the South Pacific, Solomon Islands. It could do this under its Belt and Road Initiative. The second reason is because BRI agreements undermine good government governance. There's no doubt Belt and Road loans are feeding into corruption and also leading to elite capture, this phenomenon whereby China has built vanity projects for elites in developing countries, and then they give China patronage. They feel oblig obligated to work with China and be sympathetic to China's wishes. Um, for obvious reasons, instances of corruption are very difficult to record. However, it has been reported in the Washington Post that um, in a particular example, this photograph here, um, there was corruption between China and Malaysia in 2016. 
In this instance, China offered to help cover up alleged corruption by the then Malaysian Prime Minister and bail out a Malaysian company also accused of corruption. China's price was that Malaysia had to sign up to million dollar Belt and Road Initiative projects, which it did. And a final reason we should care about the Belt and Road is because BRI projects are often poor quality, bad for the environment and unsustainable. And another reason I haven't mentioned is that some of these projects are white elephants, meaning that they are, have no real use and that they're grand projects and that they're very um, expensive to maintain. So this is actually a photograph of Independence Highway in Papua New Guinea. It's a six lane highway that hardly gets used, but it was built uh, around the time when Papua New Guinea was hosting APEC. And it was actually built on top of another highway that was functioning that had been funded with Australian aid and development money. So in this instance, Papua New Guinea chose to accept a kind of grand vanity project from China. Did Papua New Guinea need the road? Well, it did need a road there, but it didn't need a six lane highway. So if we should care about this, what have we actually done to help counter this challenge of China's Belt and Road? Look, this is a short timeline of announcements that have happened over the last couple of years. There's no need to read the detail. All I will say is that from 2018, Australia, the United States and Japan have tried to pool their resources to create a uh, functioning alternative to China's Belt and Road. Not only is there the Trilateral Infrastructure Partnership, but there's also things like the Quad Initiative on Infrastructure. So the Quad Grouping, which includes India, now also includes a, an infrastructure working group. And also the United States and Japan via the Group of Seven, the G7 countries, have also um, launched an initiative called Partnerships for Global Infrastructure and Investment. But despite all of these announcements over the last couple of years, there's only been one completed project between Australia, the United States and Japan, and that's one undersea fibre optic cable that connects Palau, another small Pacific Island country, uh, with a more major internet cable. That project cost $30 million for Australia. In contrast, in the first half of 2022 alone, China spent $30 billion on its Belt and Road Initiative globally. So even though we've had things like COVID, the Belt and Road Initiative isn't slowing to a halt. It's continuing on. So this really got me thinking, um, why don't I compare the China's Belt and Road Initiative with US and Australia, Japan and India's alternative offerings? What I found was it's a clear choice if I was the leader of a developing country, either in Southeast Asia or the Pacific, the choice was obvious. I would always choose China's Belt and Road. The main reason I would choose it is because of the speed. China can have an agreement in three months and it can start breaking ground and have a functioning infrastructure asset within only a year. It's really incredible. And the, the way that China is able to do that is because it manages the project from conception to completion. It acts as a project manager and it's able to actually plan things, deliver them, and then hand over the infrastructure to the host country. In contrast, when Australia, Japan, and um, the United States are talking to developing countries about infrastructure, sometimes we can take a very long time to negotiate anything. And it could take say three years, and at the end of that three-year process, we might say we're not actually going to build anything. So we take a lot longer to actually say no to countries, and that's very frustrating for countries that are looking for critical infrastructure now. Again, with the finance, um, China is giving you know, very high interest loans in a lot of cases, uh, but it is uh, easy to access and it's upfront. In contrast, the US and allied offering actually relies on private sector buy-in initially. So we have to convince private companies that this is a good investment. And not only that, the United States also has to convince Congress to actually fund these initiatives. So that means that there's a lot of barriers to access. Now, on the next metric, which is transparency, 
this might actually look like it is trending in our favor, in the US, Japan, and Australia's favor, because China has very low transparency and there's high room for corruption. And we have very high transparency. The problem is that a lot of developing countries actually understand that corruption is one of the ways that business happens in their country and they prefer some corruption. So this can actually appear like it's um, to our favor, but in practice, it is not. Similar on the quality metric. In fact, a lot of Chinese projects are low quality, but if China wants, it can put in a bid for a higher quality, which is why China is able to win certain World Bank projects is because it just lifts its quality standards. In contrast, the offering that the US, Australia and others have is extremely high quality. And this is actually can be a barrier to entry for developing countries in the private sector. So at the moment, what we have suggested and what we're doing is we've contracted the OECD to develop these quality measures for something called the Blue Dot Network. In a nutshell, the Blue Dot Network is meant to act as a certification scheme so that countries or private, private sector get a Blue Dot tick of approval to say, this is a really high quality project. The problem is that the OECD has suggested 10 different quality measures and the current requirements are so strict that I've heard from Australian officials that some infrastructure projects that have already been built in Australia wouldn't meet the Blue Dot Network certification. So you can see where we're trying to have the highest quality offering is still just not really working and is kind of prohibitive for developing countries. Um, and finally, on this issue of type, the main point I wanted to make here is that China's willing to build almost anything, anywhere for anyone. They could be developed countries like New Zealand or developing countries like Cambodia. And it also doesn't ask a lot of questions. It just asks countries, what would you like us to build? In comparison, our offering is very restricted, restrictive. Uh, we only want to build things that are going to be fantastic for the environment, the local community, and also enshrine good governance. And that actually requires a lot of upfront buy-in from developing countries, and it basically costs more. So this is really difficult, um, basically, to convince countries that our offering is better than what China is offering. And this is a really good example. This is the Jakarta-Bandung High-Speed Railway. It's meant to connect the cities of Jakarta and Bandung via 142 kilometers of railroad, railway, railway. Now, both China and Japan bid for this project, but China won. Japan's proposal offered a faster but more expensive train line. China, in, on the other hand, had a slower train, but it was much cheaper. And China also offered to pay for the whole thing rather than make the Indonesian government guarantee the project with loans in case construction ever went over budget. So what happened? Indonesia chose the Chinese bid, but construction went over budget anyway. Now Indonesia is trying to bail out the project and has spent around $287 million. So what's going to happen next time? Is Indonesia going to choose Japan over the Chinese offering? Well, actually, that's a really interesting question. And in fact, different provinces of different countries might decide to continue to go with China, hoping that China's learned its lesson and that it's reforming the Belt and Road. And put frankly, if you only have a couple of years term in government, you're, real, you're thinking about getting critical infrastructure to your people faster so that you'll get voted back in. And the next government might likely be settled with the high interest debt. So the value proposition is a really complex one because governments want to get re-elected and they want to deliver things for their people right now. So just speeding through these last couple, what I wanted to illustrate with this slide is that it made me start thinking, why are we trying to do this in the first place? Why are the United States, Japan and Australia trying to pool their resources to meet this challenge? There are three possible reasons why we could be trying to create an alternative. The first reason is to counter the Belt and Road harms. The second reason could be because we want to respond to developing countries' requests and improve their development and economic prospects. 
And a third potential reason could be we actually want to seize this opportunity and create more um, initiative or more opportunities for our individual private sectors. The truth is the reason that we are pooling our resources and not working individually anymore is because we want to counter the Belt and Road harms. And specifically, we want to counter the strategic threats posed by China's Belt and Road. That means that we're mostly worried about China taking control over dual use infrastructure, those ports and airfields, also communication systems and electricity. If we were really going to respond to developing countries' requests, we would be doing this under more of a development and aid framework, which we're not doing. Again, if we wanted to attract the private sector, we'd be talking more to the private sector and working hand in hand with them, what we're not currently doing. So what, where I say here that motivation should determine the response, if the, what we actually want to do is counter the harms caused by China's Belt and Road, we should be prioritizing these strategic infrastructure assets. So these are my recommendations. That first one is prioritize strategic infrastructure, ports, airfields, telecommunications, and energy. The second thing that I really think we should do individually is increase the flexibility of our offering. We want the quality to actually be an asset and not an anchor around developing countries next. So what we need to do is actually lower our quality standards, but still have them higher than what China is willing to offer. We just don't want them to be prohibitive. We also need to actually um, expand what we're going to build. We need to look at partners in a more flexible way, and we need to listen more to what developing countries are asking for. The next two points are quite interesting. Establish a forecasting unit and don't cooperate. So what I am actually suggesting through this is on the forecasting unit, a lot of the time, the US, Australia and Japan are chasing the Chinese flag around the region. In the Pacific, China is looking at building a defence base in Solomon Islands, and it's also offering a lot of infrastructure in Pacific Island countries. And I want to make one example. This year, Australia spent $1.3 billion to purchase a telecommunications company that operates in the Pacific Islands. The company is called Digicel, and the Australian government partnered with an Australian company, Telstra, to do a takeover of Digicel. The reason we purchased Digicel is because Digicel had actually approached Australia uh, saying that a Chinese company was interested in purchasing it and asking Australia to help with some of the due diligence around that. The Australian government determined that actually it was more in our strategic interests to be able to control Digicel because telecommunications can be used to collect data on countries and can also be used for espionage. So we made a strategic calculation that we should spend public money, more than a billion dollars, to purchase this company that operates in the Pacific. The problem is we can't keep doing that. We don't have billions and billions worth of public funds to keep buying up every different company that comes calling. And so what we need to do is get out in front and actually um, start to forecast ahead of time and make proactive approaches to countries in the region so that we're the ones with proactive offers, not China. So to have all my key takeaways, what I wanted to say is we need to build what matters to us. We need to focus on the strategic infrastructure because that's why we're here. We need to actually be more flexible in what we're willing to build and who we're willing to build it for. We need to plan ahead through things like a forecasting unit so we're not playing whack-a-mole in the Pacific. And finally, we need to stop trying to cooperate. It might sound counterintuitive because we're trying to pool our resources and we're all trying to do the same thing. But ultimately, that is creating huge bureaucratic delays, and it's really preventing us from getting out ahead of China. So that is my presentation, and I really look forward to hearing from my fellow panelists.
Thank you so much, Hayley, for that really energising and quite honestly fascinating overview of the issues at play and what are some of the practical ways that we could respond to the challenge of BRI. One of the most interesting suggestions that I took away from that was the idea of coordinating, not cooperating. And I'm really looking forward to hearing what our other two panellists have to say about that as well as welcoming questions. Uh, and just to remind the audience, uh, we've got a couple more speakers and then we'll have about 20 minutes towards the end for questions. So please do send those through on the chat as they come to you. Uh, our next speaker is Hiroyuki Suzuki. As I mentioned at the outset, he is based in Washington, the Chief Representative of Japan Bank for International Cooperation. Suzuki-san has a more than two decade experience working on uh, infrastructure projects for JBIC, including in Latin America and across Southeast Asia, and including really interestingly, a number of projects that bring together Japan-China cooperation. So I'm very much looking forward to hearing the Japan perspective on this challenge. If I can hand over to you now, Suzuki-san, for some comments. Thank you. Thank you very, very much for your kind introduction, Kaysen. Uh, my name is Hiroki Suzuki, Chief Representative JP Washington Office. So firstly, uh, let me uh, quickly explain about the JBIC, operation of the JBIC. Uh, traditionally, our main focus is supporting the Japanese industry's business activities overseas. But uh, recently, we are expanding our, our effort to tackling the global issues such as uh, decarbonization and the social issue also. I also would like to mention that one of the characteristics of the JBIC is we closely uh, collaborate with private company and private financial institution. And we have the a principle that supplementing the financial transaction implemented by the private sector financial institution. So therefore, uh, we, uh, in principle, we always uh, co-financing with private uh, financial, pre-private banks. So therefore, we uh, very uh, 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 understand the market appetite and the uh, uh, sentiment from the private side. So it is uh, totally different from the business model of the Belt Road Initiative. So in this regard, uh, many uh, other DFI shows a strong interest to collaborate with JBIC, including USDFC, I believe. And today I'd like to uh, uh, share with you the, our current effort to uh, collaborate with US counterpart and also the other like-minded countries. Our collaboration with US is, the core is collaboration with current USDFC and the two developed and they supporting the project uh, globally, but uh, in the Indo-Pacific region in particular. And also, in addition to the collaboration with uh, DFC, now we have also the collaboration platform with USTDA to utilize their function of the technical assistant and the feasibility study to the host government. The background of creating uh, additional uh, collaboration with TDA is finding the bankable or the creating the bankable project in the developing country is highly challenging. So therefore, the, from the early stage, we would like to collaborate with USDDA to support, provide the support for the uh, host government to create the uh, bankable project, and then move to for the pri uh, preparation to provide the financing together with USDFC. I also would like to mention that this uh, bilateral cooperation is developing to the multilateral basis. As mentioned uh, by Heli San, uh, we created a trilateral infrastructure partnership. And even it is a very small amount, we supported the Palau Submarine Cable Project co-financed by the trilateral parties. But in addition to that, uh, we are sending the joint mission to Indo-Pacific region, such as uh, Papua New Guinea, Indonesia, and Vietnam. So I strongly believe this effort to send in a joint mission to the host country is in line with one of the uh, recommendation which was mentioned in the paper that identifying goals and the infrastructure priority of the uh, host, each host country. I also would like to mention that we are uh, uh, tackling with uh, uh, creating the quadrilateral cooperation 
engaging India. Always engaging India is very highly challenging. But uh, at the time of the Quad Summit in Tokyo in May, uh, we provided just a loan to Exim Bank of India to support the Indian healthcare sector. So it is uh, one of the characteristics of the, we call internally the loose collaboration uh, with uh, our US counterpart. We set the goal of the, for the target country and the target sector. And the, under the, uh, this kind of the umbrella collaboration uh, platform, each institution uh, make a best effort to support the in parallel. So in case of the supporting the Indian pharmaceutical sector, we support it uh, uh, through the Indian Exim Bank. But on the other hand, USDFC provided a separate finance to Biological E in India. Because uh, in case of the USDFC, uh, uh, USDFC is very challenge, challenging to support the financing to state-owned enterprise. So this kind of the interoperability is a, a very hectic uh, 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 problem to create a uh, co-financing project uh, among the, uh, the uh, like our, uh, our counterpart. But as mentioned by the Harrison, that this kind of the loose coordination is one of the possible collaboration to mobilize uh, the efforts from the each DFI and the also uh, also uh, it also the mo mobilizing the private cap uh, private uh, private uh, enterprises. So we would like to keep, I would say, both cooperation and the coordination with our uh, uh, counterparts of the like-minded country, especially the U.S. counterpart. But we would like to be uh, more proactive, not to be active. So it is very challenging to compete with the uh, other uh, business model, uh, but uh, we would like to enhance the uh, coordination more. So I, step, I, I stop here. So I'd like to hear from the Erin San and also look forward to have a fruitful discussion. Thank you. Thanks very much, Suzuki-san, and really valuable to hear that, that perspective from Japan and particularly your, your practical experience in your role in, in JBIG. Uh, I'm going to move straight to Erin uh, to introduce her to the group. As I mentioned, she's the Deputy Director and Senior Fellow for the Economics Program at the Centre for Strategic and International Studies in Washington. Erin has a long career working in both the public and private sector. She's been a senior analyst on Asian political and foreign policy issues at the Central Intelligence Agency, director for the Indo-Pacific at the US International Development Finance Corporation, and a founder and principal of her boutique advisory firm focused on Myanmar. So Erin, you bring some really interesting perspectives to this discussion. Can I hand over to you for some comments? Thank you, Kate, and uh, congratulations to Haley for getting the paper out, and also thanks to Perth USA, US Asia Center for, for hosting me um, this evening. And um, I, I will follow on with a lot of points that Suzuki-san presented, mostly from the DSC perspective, but also how development finance works. Um, Haley's paper really pointed out what a lot of the challenges are, and I think that it is incredibly timely, as Kate said and is good at highlighting what the challenges are, but also where we should go from here. I think the hardest part is to convince policymakers that infrastructure projects take a long time. And it's hard for a financial institution working within a policy, foreign policy and national security framework uh, that needs things done yesterday. Uh, projects can take years from concept to contract to breaking out the shovels. So, you know, it just takes time. For the DFC, uh, the U.S. International Development Finance Corporation, um, big infrastructure projects hasn't always been its main focus. Uh, bankable projects has. So just to give a brief overview of, of what its mandate is now, it is uh, a new version of the Overseas Private Investment Corporation. Um, it is meant to mobilize private sector capital. And as Suzuki-san uh, mentioned before, DFC typically does not support public sector projects or sovereign backed projects um, or state owned enterprises. I think there's an effort to be a little bit more lenient on that. 
and take it at least on a case by case basis. But obviously, you can see what the challenges are, are there, uh, given that Southeast Asia, the prevalence of SOEs, especially in infrastructure, makes it already um, kicks DFC out of of what potentially that could be. So uh, one of the good changes through the Build Act that created the DFC is that the DFC dropped its US nexus requirement, so it can now invest with any local, domestic, or private sector entity um, in a given country in which it's eligible. Um, there's a real focus on energy and climate, um, which can limit what DFC can do, especially in infrastructure. Uh, they typically do not do concessional lending, and the priorities are on commercially viable and highly developmental projects in low and lower middle income countries. So even if a project uh, is in a highly strategic economy, it may be that it's an upper middle income or high income country as defined by the World Bank and the DFC can't work there. So for example, in the Latin American con construct, uh, the DFC can't work in Panama and there are a lot of highly valuable and critical infrastructure projects in which it should work, but cannot. Uh, DFC is also closed in Thailand and Bangladesh uh, due to labor issues. So that also precludes a lot of potential cooperation. Um, there are a lot of questions as to why China can move so quickly and the US can't. I think Haley's paper really focuses on that, the need for speed, uh, not to get all top gun on everyone, but it, it really matters. Um, China lends in dollars, has very short tenors, has higher interest rates than you would expect. But where it gets across the finish line is with the speed at which it's able to support an infrastructure project, the speed at which it's able to make a decision um, and provide a turnkey operation. Now, this doesn't necessarily mean that China can deliver. And I think that there's an opportunity here for um, the US and like minded companies to, or countries and companies uh, to step in. And that 60% of BRI country uh, recipients are in debt distress. And I think that China is starting to understand the importance of due diligence and really accepting the results of certain feasibility studies. I think Sri Lanka is a great example of that. Um, but there's plenty of evidence that BRI is not necessarily working as well as it could, and it doesn't deliver all of the time. The China-Pakistan economic corridor and the Kenya Railway, I think, really show that speed doesn't always deliver. Um, I think, you know, the point that Haley was making on co-financing is a real important one. Uh, it's much more difficult than it looks. I mean, it's great to say, let's all work together. But considering that JBEC, um, Australia's institutions and DFC support private sector, that already puts us at um, an antithetical lens uh, from the business community, which is competition, not necessarily collaboration. It's great for us to work together, but not necessarily for businesses. Multiple government loans to one project is not readily accepted and, and you know, welcomed. And that certainly needs to be structured differently. Multiple term sheets, multiple due diligence uh, procedures, there needs to be more of a structure there. Um, also trying to wade through the different mandates and standards, and that's mostly in terms of due diligence and requirements. A country nexus, JPEG requires some sort of Japan flavor. The US has dropped that, um, and there might be different priorities. Um, mobilizing private sector capital isn't necessarily easy either. Um, we talk about the length of, lack of bankable projects. That's still a problem for the private sector as well. Um, if there's no private sector money going in, what's the public sector doing there? Um, you know, partly to work on an enabling environment. Uh, the DFC, for instance, provides political risk insurance to help de-risk investments, but some places are just either too risky and that includes the multilateral development banks like the World Bank, the Asian Development Bank. They need to maintain their high credit ratings and working in some of these markets just isn't viable. Um, and there are very few bankable projects. So we're already all competing for those small amounts of projects. So trying to change that mindset of being collaborative uh, rather than competitive, I think is going to be very difficult. Haley's paper um, talks about coming up with a forecasting unit, which I think is a really interesting idea of coming up with priority projects. So we're kind of first in the door. Um, I think one thing to make this recommendation work is to have experienced transaction officers 
to be able to work their DFC, USTDA, determine where and how public sector interventions could and should work, um, separate the vanity projects from the viable ones. And um, someone you need to have people who understand how business operates, but what a good project looks like. I mean, you know, uh, embassies are great, political officers are great, economic officers are also great, but that's they're not necessarily project uh, experts. Um, I would, I think, kind of end on an example of where it's worked and backs up this idea of collaborating rather than co-financing on these projects. And I think one area of success um, has was the COVID-19 vaccine quad effort. Um, it was announced in March, 2021. I'm getting all my years mixed up. COVID has really kind of erased my brain. Um, but that was a project, um, and you can look at you know any of our government uh, press releases to see where this was. DFC has one, and the White House has one from uh, March 2021 that really outlines what everybody's role was. But the idea was um, there was a goal for the Quad, and it was to address the lack of vaccines in the developing world in low and lower middle income countries, particularly in Southeast Asia and the Pacific Islands. So what do we need to do to get there? One, we have to boost manufacturing and two, we need to be able to deliver it. And so this was a chance for all the partners to bring its strengths together to achieve a particular goal. And I think one reason why it was successful is because it was relatively narrow and defined, um, but kind of broad and flexible enough for us to kind of find our ways into this. Um, the DFC provided a $50 million loan to an Indian company called Biological E to help expand its manufacturing. JBIC provided a capital injection to BioE's day-to-day -day operation. Uh, Australia was provided last mile delivery um, and had already been working on efforts and expanding on efforts of distributing vaccines in the Pacific Islands. And um, all three countries uh, were Japan, Australia, and the United States were working on last mile delivery throughout the region. India played a role, not just on the private sector uh, component, but also in making sure that uh, the approvals for BioE's uh, new vaccine manufacturing line uh, went through and there were no export issues. I'm not saying it was the smoothest thing because as Suzuki-san mentioned, it's challenging to work with India, but I think it's an example of the success that the partners can have is looking at a, an issue, looking at where we fit in on a project life cycle. Um, and I think that that can be replicated on um, energy projects, uh, infrastructure projects um, going forward. So again, thank you for the opportunity to help support the publication of this paper and look forward to your questions. Thanks so much, Erin, including for ending, I think on a really positive note actually, because it's, possible listening to this to, to the scale of the challenge to feel like there's there's not a really a way around this and I think the vaccine example that you use is really interesting because that was such a thorny problem that countries actually were able to cooperate on and end up at a, at a good place to have a good outcome so look team we have 17 minutes for for questions from the audience please if you have a question put it into the chat and I'll put it to the relevant panelists but while you're thinking of questions I'm going to use the chair's prerogative and put a few questions of my own. Hayley could I put my, my first question to you I'm really interested in this idea of a forecasting unit can you share with the with the audience a, a little bit more of your thoughts about how that might work in in practice? Well, thanks, Kate. And yeah, this is one of the more difficult suggestions because forecasting sounds like it's going to predict exactly where China will invest or where developing countries will ask for help. And that's just not how things work in real life. Um, you know, things happen sporadically and sometimes um, China might be interested in something that we don't think is necessarily strategic, but then along the line, it becomes strategic. So when I say forecasting unit, I don't mean that it would be be able to predict exactly where China would like to invest. What I'd like it to do is combine a lot of analytics and actually collect data on the region. And then from that list, it would also need to amalgamate the different strategic priorities of Australia, Japan, United States, maybe New Zealand as well. And it would have to overlay that with what Pacific Island countries are asking for 
and also the capacities of Pacific Island governments to manage the infrastructure, because that is another challenge I think I highlighted in the Papua New Guinea example where Australia had already built a road and then China just builds a bigger road on top of that. You know, do we get the benefit from the original road that we built? Not really. So you have to be discerning in the types of partners that you're willing to work with. But a forecasting unit would need to amalgamate all of this data. So that's extremely complex, but it's currently, I need, I think it needs to be housed out of the various governments. So not in the US government or Australian government. It would probably need to include some government officials because you would need a security clearance to understand some of the strategic challenges. But basically, it would operate independently of government as a, a single unit and be able to highlight where are the biggest challenges going to arise. But I do not pretend for a second that it would be easy. It would be extremely difficult. But hopefully, if we start moving in this direction, we start feeding information and we start collecting data. Um, we can start to get ahead of, you know, always chasing China's lead. So I think we need to start somewhere. And even if a forecasting unit wouldn't be perfect initially, what we could do is give it, like Erin said, give it a narrow focus. So already um, Australia, the US and Japan have worked on projects that are about communications and energy. We have an energy project together with New Zealand in Papua New Guinea. We could use those two as pilot areas and pick a couple of countries in the Pacific and just keep the focus narrow to begin with. But we really do need to start somewhere because, you know, spending $1.3 billion to buy one company, you know, that's a, a huge chunk of Australia's foreign aid budget. So we just can't keep going on as we've been doing. We need something to help us have a more accurate picture. Thanks, Hayley. Uh, there's, a, there's, a, there's a lot in that, which I'm really looking forward to talking with you about more after the webinar. Uh, we've got a question in on the chat that I'm going to put, it's a question about Australia, but I'm going to put it to the whole panel because I'm interested in, in reactions and go to you first, Hayley. Why has Australia failed to stop China's influence in the Pacific, and particularly in the Solomon Islands? And what should it what should it do to stop Chinese future influence in the Pacific region? I think some of those answers are in some of the initiatives that you're talking about, but this is a really, it's actually a really big question that it's at the heart of your research and at the heart of the work that Suzuki Sun and Erin are doing as well. What, what can we do? Yeah, it's you, and then I'll ask for um, reactions from Erin and then Suzuki Sun. It's certainly something that I heard when I went to Washington DC, Americans saying to me that, Australia dropped the ball on the Pacific. Uh, unsurprisingly, it's a bit more complicated than that. Um, if I was a developing country, I'd be doing exactly what they are doing. I would be trying to get the best deal for the people that I represent. And I don't think that um, Australia dropped the ball or any of you know, the United States or Japan. Um, the key thing is that these are developing countries in critical need of infrastructure now, and they will take it however they can get it. Um, and it's good for them to have this competition because now we see, you know, um, was it 12 Pacific Island leaders visited Biden in the White House? And so now attention is actually back on the Pacific. Um, so I would just say that um, we are still trying to solve this problem together. We should continue to coordinate. But ultimately, what we need to do is to get rid of some of the bureaucracy. We need to be acting independently. And I mean, Japan has been an incredible provider of infrastructure in the region for decades. It just doesn't trumpet its successes as much as China does. So perhaps Suzuki-san can talk about that because Japan has been active for years. Um, let me mix up the order then. That's a nice segue to, can I pass to you Suzuki-san for some reactions on that question? So when we have the uh, discussion with the host government, uh, they don't want to be the battlefield between the, especially between the China and the US. So there, therefore the, I think the Japanese approach is more uh, nuanced uh, than uh, you may to, to compete with China. Uh, so for example, in case of the uh, Bruto network, uh, you, uh, the Harry mentioned, Harry some mentioned, it is uh, the concept of the operationalize the quality infrastructure principle, which has agreed among the G20 country. 
including China. So our narrative is more engaging with the old country. But uh, even to, to, to collaborate with uh, other countries, we always set the, uh, some uh, global standards of the quality infrastructure. So JBIC have a MOU with the China Development Bank. So even in that platform, we set the three conditions, five conditions, transparency, openness, feasibility of the uh, project, the sustainability for the host government and the rule of the law. So if the counterparts in line with this, this kind of the global standard, we can cooperate with anybody. So that's uh, uh, one of the uh, approach towards the developing country, especially in the Indo-Pacific region right now by, the, uh, by Japan. And the, we strongly believe this kind of the approach is highly expected from the regional country. Erin, can I pass to you? And I'm going to um, add in another layer of questions. There's a few questions that have come in that are all on a similar theme, which is around the question of whether uh, thinking about infrastructure support to counter the harms of BRI leads to a securitization of aid. So interested in US perspectives on that thorny question. And then I might circle back to you, Haley and Suzuki-san, and then I'm sorry, we're gonna run out of time, but Erin, Views on aid slash securitization slash actual security threats to uh, the US and allied partners in the region. How do we unpick that? Sure. I mean, I, I think the Pacific Islands kind of represents this as well. I mean, the US sometimes has to be reminded where um, it's needed. And um, when Secretary Clinton was Secretary of State, um, she went to the Pacific Islands, did some island hopping herself. And so you see a lot of um, Kurt Campbell, who's now the, the coordinator for Indo-Pacific policy, his hand in a lot of these things. And, you know, he certainly recognizes this. Um, but, you know, this, this question of aid and development finance, um, they're one in the same, but they're also, there's a lot of differences there as well. Development finance um, has a lot more, has different restrictions on it. For example, um, you know, for the DFC, and I'll give it from the DFC perspective and also you know, how the US is looking at it. Because when the DFC was created, it was meant to counter BRI and do exactly what we're talking about here. But you know, with a $60 billion budget, um, you know, that's, that's just not gonna do it and not providing the resources for it to undertake that. Plus um, not necessarily recognizing what the needs and requirements are out in the region and how its mandate very much limits what it can do. So for the Pacific Islands, um, they're looking for more grants and concessional loans, but mostly on grants. And that's just what DFC can't do. But USAID can provide grants, but not in a way that it can fund infrastructure projects. The other thing is that these markets are, are incredibly small. And it's hard to find, like these aren't going to be money makers for private sector and it's gonna be a tough sell um, for development finance institutions to go in there. I mean, this is truly a, a benevolent effort to go in. Um, sure, you could see this as a, a security measure as well. I don't think that the US is always looking at that. I mean, you could say a port support until it's not a port. So, um, you know, we're definitely seeing that in the Pacific Islands. So, um, I think what it's it's trying to do is to provide an alternate. I mean, I I know there's a lot of China hawks out there that, um, especially in Congress, that are like, yes, we need to build ports and airstrips, and then you know we can also use that for ourselves. And uh, if we need to to counter um, the Chinese, um, and it, including in Southeast Asia, but I don't think any country wants to be a pawn. I think Haley's exactly right that you know the Pacific Islands. I would do exactly what they're doing as well. I mean you can only come out as a winner, but like they're on a very intense timeline, especially with climate change. They need infrastructure. They got decimated by COVID um, and, and they need these things, but it's hard. And I think DFC is really trying to figure out its own mission here is what is it supposed to be? Is it a national security tool? Is it a foreign policy tool? Sometimes those things don't always exactly link up. Um, does its investments with taxpayer money want to be used as you know layers upon layers? Um, a lot of these countries have bad memories of you know the United Fruit Company and other things, and really see ghosts in the 
in the forest of what U.S. investments are. And, you know, the Chinese are right there to tell them like, oh, you know, they're just doing this to gain your favor, but it's really like an impetus for the CIA to come in. It's a Trojan horse. Um, this is a very winded, windy answer, but um, I, I think it's it's a debate and it, it's a tough one, but I, you know, I would like to think that, you know, the U.S. government is completely benevolent and kind hearted and really thinking about helping the people. And certainly that's in the mission. But there is this this concern about strategic competition that could boil over into some sort of conflict, uh, whether it's, you know, physical Taiwan, South China Sea, things over the Pacific Islands um, that are very close to U.S. Uh, islands and territories. So it's certainly, I think, in the back of everyone's minds. Erin, thank you for that. Now, uh, we have five minutes left, so I wanted to uh, just give the last opportunity to Suzuki-san and Haley to share their final thoughts. Suzuki-san, uh, former Prime Minister Abe launched the Japan Partnership for Quality Infrastructure and has played a, re played a really leading role in Japan's work in this space. Oh, I was interested to hear about the cooperation that Japan has with China. Could, could you share any final thoughts with us about What's the future for that cooperation? And is Japan, in fact, now trying to compete with China on infrastructure rather than work with it? As I mentioned, we have to prepare the appropriate alternative of the Belt Road Initiative because the regional country has a strong concern to create the new debt trap situation. So we need to be open to for the not exclusive basis for a specific country, but the, we need to keep the high standard of the quality infrastructure. So still the it's ongoing effort, but the trilateral cooperation, infrastructure cooperation among US, Japan and Australia is one of the, uh, the, the steps to create very swift and the also flexible support to create the bankable project and the pro pro provide appropriate financing uh, as support for the infrastructure project in the in the region. So it is a that, that had some potential, and the, it is a good idea to include a forecasting unit and um, in the trilateral infrastructure partnership. So we would like to keep our effort, uh, including the, some recommendation. Uh, from the Haley Sun today. Thank you very much. Thank you, Suzuki Sun. Haley, the final word to you, and I'll squeeze in a final question that just came in. So, any final summing up thoughts from you and any views on the final question, which was how likely it might be that we would see future attacks on Chinese infrastructure projects uh, with Pakistan and Myanmar in mind? Mm. Well, just to answer that question before um, summing up, I would say um, China is increasing the sophistication of its Belt and Road infrastructure program. It is recognising that the debt is unsustainable and it is also seeing that it's not buying itself positive influence in a number of countries, hence the attacks on Chinese workers. So, yes, probably we will see more, but I think China is actually adapting its offering and we're seeing the Belt and Road slow down and that's a consequence of both the Chinese government rec recognizing that they're overspending and also developing countries have been going a bit lukewarm on some China's Belt and Road investment. So I think China will gradually improve its offering over time and we will end up seeing more positivity towards China's Belt and Road. My final summing up is just to say if the United States and its allies want to be competitive against China's Belt and Road, we need to act like a business. We need to actually recognize that this is a business model and that countries are choosing, developing countries in the private sector are often choosing not based off of any strategic interest. They're basing it off their own personal interest, developing countries because they need the infrastructure and private sector because they're looking for profit. So if we want to be successful, we need to have a better offering. And right now, what we're offering isn't structured to beat China. So if we are really serious about this, we need to have a good look at ourselves and then reshape what we're willing to provide so that we can be more successful. 
Hayley, thank you so much. And thank you to all of you for joining us for this discussion today. Can I thank Kuroki Suzuki from the Japan Bank for International Cooperation and Erin Murphy from the Centre for Strategic and International Studies. And of course, Hayley, for your paper. These are really, really complex issues that we're trying to unpick and come up with policy responses. And if I think in my life as a former public servant of some of the most complex issues that I've dealt with, this would rank as I think one of the, the top most complex challenges because we're talking about how do you leverage private sector finance for a project that may be unbankable? How do you move the kind of hardwired approach of allies to cooperate and move from that to coordinate and not do everything together at the same time? How do you encourage anyone, whether it's a policymaker or a business, to engage in a commercially unviable project when actually security implications are such that you must find a way to do that. So I think this has been a really timely discussion, some absolutely critical recommendations that I know will give policymakers who've been joining this call some thoughts to think about. I do encourage everyone to please go to the Perth US Asia website to download the report if you haven't already done so. I thank you very much for joining us and we look forward to seeing you again at our next webinar. Thanks very much. Thanks, Kate. Thanks, everybody. Bye, all.